This is Josiah Plays Lone Wolf Book 6 The Kingdoms of Terror You are Lone Wolf, the last Kai Master of Summerland. Following your discovery of the Book of the Magna Kai, you have vowed to restore the Order of the Kai to their former glory. To achieve this, you must find the Lore Stone of Veretta, a treasure which contains the secret powers of your warrior ancestors. In the Kingdoms of Terror, you must follow a trail of ancient clues that will take you deep into the hostile Stormlands, where war, treachery, and intrigue will conspire to defeat your quest. Choose your weapons and your skills with care. The future of your country depends upon it. So, here we are again for yet another Lone Wolf book. As you can see, I've got the cover of the book there alongside the text. I, uh, this is the first Magna Kai adventure. What that means is the first five books of the series were called the Kai books because Lone Wolf was a Kai initiate working his way up through the ranks to become a Kai master. At that point, he switches over to a whole new tier of, uh, of ranks called Magna Kai, which are sort of the advanced ranks beyond being a master of the Kai, with new abilities and so forth. And so this is the first of the books of him being a Magna Kai. And I remember being very excited about that, and I remember liking this cover a whole lot. It's very mysterious. He's got the body of some kind of wizard or something, uh, which he's holding in his arms. There's a huge pile of skeletons, skulls, and some ruins in the background. And he's kind of looking mysteriously off into the distance. This is, I think this might be one of my favorite Lone Wolf covers. It, it's so much more intriguing. You know, it's not, it's not an action shot. It's like a, you know, what is this mysterious scene about kind of thing that you, you wonder. These books were, of course, written by Joe Deaver, and uh, the original books were illustrated by Gary Chalk. The music that you hear throughout this, throughout this stream or throughout this video is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Full uh, links to him and his work down in the description for you. And, uh, yeah, I'm ready to ready to do this. I'm pretty excited. So the one thing I did in between books was because I reached, I finished book five, I reached rank 10 of the Kai as a master, which means I got the final, the final discipline, weapon skill, and I had to roll randomly to see what my weapon was, and I rolled and I got a short sword. Now the, the summer sword, which is my magical blade, says that if you have skill with short sword, or sword, or broadsword, that any of those will count. So I've added two up here for weapon skill to my combat skill for using the summer sword. So now I have a 27, which is quite nice. I still have some stuff left over from previous books. I have 45 crowns. All right, so let's start going through this Magna Kai stuff. The story so far. You are Kai Master Lone Wolf, last of the Kai Lords of Summerland, and the sole survivor of a massacre that destroyed your warrior kinsmen during a bitter war with your age-old enemies, the Dark Lords of Helgadad. Three years have passed since your triumph over the Dark Lord Hakon at the Tomb of the Mahan, and for the Northern Realm of Summerland, these have been three years of peace and prosperity. Since Hakon's defeat, the power of the Dark Lords has waned. Rumors abound that a civil war rages in Helgadad as the lesser Dark Lords fight for power and dominion over the city. However, it is a widely held belief in Somerland that your discovery of the lost Somlending treasure, the Book of the Magna Kai, is the real reason for their power struggle. The Book of the Magna Kai is legendary in Somerland, 
With the wisdom of the Magna Chi, Sun Eagle, the first Chi Grand Master, instilled the disciplines into the warriors of Summerland that were to protect your land from devastation at the hands of the Dark Lords. The Book of the Magna Chi was lost hundreds of years ago, but its wisdom was kept alive, handed down through generations of Kai, so that they too could share the strength to resist their eternal enemies. When you discovered the Book of the Magna Chi, you gave a solemn pledge to restore the Kai to their former glory, and so ensure the security of your land in the years to come. You returned to your homeland and, in the seclusion of your monastery in the hills, set about the study of the Magna Chi disciplines. It was an exacting task, a trial of physical strength and mental fortitude. The seasons came and went, but you were unaware of the passage of time, lost in your quest for the knowledge and the skills of your warrior kin. Three years of determined study pass, revealing the secrets of three of the Magna Chi disciplines. However, the others cannot be learnt by study alone, and in order to fulfill your pledge to restore the Kai, you must complete the quest first made by Sun Eagle over a thousand years ago. When he had finally completed his quest, he recorded all his experiences in the Book of the Magna Chi, but the script has faded with the passing years, and now few words remain to guide you. Seek and find the Lore Stone of Veretta, for this alone holds the power and the wisdom. Are the few words you can still decipher of the Grand Master's Chronicle. Although the verse is brief, you are not without hope, for you recognize the name Veretta. It is one of the oldest cities of Magnamund, lying in the Stornlands, beyond the Machen Gorge, far to the south of Summerland. You realize that you must set out upon the quest without delay, for the war in Halgadad will not last indefinitely, and the Dark Lord swore long ago to conquer your country and destroy your people. As soon as their civil strife is resolved, the victorious Lords of Evil will turn on Somerland and summon the creatures of the Dark Realm to thwart your quest. You must therefore act quickly and with secrecy, for your life and the future of Somerland depend on your success. And so, guided by the words of your ancient mentor, and with the shadow of the Dark Lords ever-present, you set out on the quest for the Lore Stone of Veretta, unaware of the wonders and the horrors that await you in the Stormlands. So, this is a whole different kind of story from the ones we've had before. In all of the previous books, Lone Wolf was sort of had a quest sort of put upon him by circumstances or by directly being told to do something by the king or whatever, where he had a quest that was given to him to do. Now he's sort of more self-directed. It's like he's grown up. Um, I think it's been five years since the start of the first book. And uh, I read somewhere else. There's I read in uh, one of the supplementary things of these books that... Lone Wolf was 15 years old when the first book starts. And he's just trying to figure out his way, and he's kind of going where he must go and doing what he's told. But by this point, he's 20, or in his early 20s, and uh, he's kind of grown up, and now he's, he's started his own mission. He's kind of self-directed, which changes the whole tone of things. You know, the king hasn't sent him to do this. He's decided he wants to do it. So he spent three years learning the first three disciplines. That's a, a discipline a year. That's a long time to learn something. But now he has to get this lore stone so he can learn the rest. So let's move forward. The game rules have not changed. Carry your current scores of combat and skill and endurance over. Yeah. Carry over your stuff. Okay. Now, during your training as a Kai Lord, and in the course of the adventures that led to the discovery of the Book of the Magna Kai, you have mastered all ten of the basic warrior skills known as the Kai Disciplines. That's all these over here. I got them all. After studying the Book of the Magna Kai, you have also reached the rank of Kai Master Superior, which means that you have learnt three of the Magna Kai Disciplines listed below. And if I click on this, now I get the Magna Kai Disciplines that come up, and none of them are checked off yet. It is up to you to choose which three skills these are. 
As all of the Magna Chi disciplines may be of use to you at some point on your adventure, pick your three with care. The correct use of a Magna Chi discipline at the right time can save your life. The Magna Chi skills are divided into groups, each of which is governed by a separate school of training. These groups are called lore circles, and you see down here I've got the lore circles um, at the bottom of my little stats keeper thing here. By mastering all of the Magna Chi disciplines in a particular lore circle, you can gain an increase in your combat skill and endurance score. See the section lore circles of the Magna Chi. In the years before their massacre, the Chi Masters of Summerlin devoted themselves to the study of the Magna Chi. These skills were divided into four schools of training called lore circles. By mastering all of the Magna Chi disciplines of a lore circle, the Chi Masters developed their fighting prowess and their physical and mental stamina to a level far higher than any mortal warrior could otherwise attain. So there's the Circle of Fire, which requires weapon mastery and hunts mastery, the Circle of Light, which requires animal control and curing, the Circle of Solaris, which requires invisibility, hunts mastery, and passmanship, and the Circle of the Spirit, which requires Psy Surge, Psy Screen, Nexus, and Divination. And when I complete, once I have, you know, whichever these two or three or four um, disciplines, I automatically gain these bonuses permanently to my combat skill and endurance, which is pretty great. So I need to choose my three Magna Chi disciplines. Uh, I'm not going to go through and read all of them. I'm just going to read the three that I choose. I don't want weapon mastery. I don't want animal control. I don't need curing yet because I have healing still from the basic discipline. Visibility, hunt mastery, pathsmanship, psi surge, psi screen, nexus, and divination. All right, I know I want divination. This skill may warn a Kai Master of eminent or unseen danger, or enable him to detect an invisible or hidden enemy. It may also reveal the true purpose or intent of a stranger or strange object encountered in your adventure. Divination may enable you to communicate telepathically with another person, and a sense if a creature possesses psychic abilities. This is basically the upgraded form of Sixth Sense. Another one I know that I want is Pathsmanship, which is the upgraded form of Tracking. In addition to the basic skill of being able to recognize the correct path in unknown territory, the Magna Chi skill of pathsmanship will enable a Chi master to read foreign languages, decipher symbols, read footprints and tracks, even if they have been disturbed, and detect the presence of most traps. It also grants him the gift of always knowing intuitively the position of north. Now the third one gets tricky. It's either going to be Hunt Mastery, Invisibility, or Curing. But I don't- I think I'll hold off on Curing for a minute. I think it's going to be Hunt Mastery or Invisibility. I think it's going to be Invisibility, the upgraded form of Camouflage. This Magna Chi skill allows a Chi Master to blend in with his surroundings, even in the most exposed terrain. It will enable him to mask his body heat and scent, and to adopt the dialect and mannerisms of any town or city that he visits. Yeah, I'm gonna take invisibility, along with my divination and pathsmanship. And now you see my rank has changed to Kai Master Superior. Next book, I'll probably take uh, Hunt Mastery, and then the book after that I'll take Curing. And then I don't know what after that. Animal Control, probably. I'm largely taking these in the same order that I took the lower version of them, of the Kai Disciplines. It's pretty much what I'm doing. I prior prioritize ones that give me more options or, or help me glean more information over any other types. Or be sneaky. I like being sneaky when I can. All right, if I successfully complete this book, I get another one, it says. All right. Equipment. Before leaving Summerlin on your quest for the Lore Stone of Veretta, you equip yourself with a map of the Stornlands. Let's take a look at that. There's the small version. The big version, part of it is going to be blocked by the uh, cover, unfortunately. Actually, you know what? I have the technology. Watch this. Ha! Huh. And then I can just bring it back in a second. Wow. 
This is some high-tech shit you're watching right now. Okay, so the Stormlands, there's the uh, coat of arms of Veretta, two cross swords on a red field. Eldenora, six-pointed star. Looks kind of like the Star of David on a black field. Lyris has a wing with a spur on red and yellow stripes. And so here's the map of the whole area. That right up there in the top corner is Ruinon. We went to Ruinon in book four. So all of the lands we were in before were all up to the, to the north and east of the northeast corner of this map. And there's the Machen Gorge. We were right there at the edge of the Machen Gorge at the end of book four. So now we're coming across the Machen Gorge and there's Veretta right there. Here in Lyris. Eldenora is down here. Okay, so this is the Stormlands region. We've taken a look at it. There's, it has a lot of little towns and stuff. Pretty cool. Let me bring the cover back. And we'll, we'll go back to the text. Okay. And a pouch of gold. A uh, random number. Nine. So I got 19 gold that was just given to me. However, I already have 45 and I'm only allowed to carry 50. So... That maxes me out at 50. The rest I'm just going to have to leave behind. Any over this number can be left in safe keeping at your Kai Monastery. Oh. Well, that's interesting. Fourteen gold crowns at Monastery. I made that note. I can take five items from the list below. A sword, a potion of Lomspur, a warhammer, a bow. That's new. We haven't had the option to use bows before. And a quiver with six arrows. Four meals, a quarter staff, a padded leather waistcoat, which I'm going to take, and I'll explain in a second, and a rope, and a dagger, and a tinderbox, and an axe. So I was reading some like Q&A stuff that they did back in the day, it, clarifying rules and clarifying things about the about the books and it says you can wear a padded leather waistcoat under the chainmail waistcoat and they will stack so I'm gonna get myself well I need to get rid of some stuff here this copper key is gonna go this black sash is gonna go this diamond is gonna go yeah I'm just throwing out diamonds I'm going to take a padded leather waistcoat and wear it beneath my chainmail waistcoat. Giving me two more endurance. Bringing me up to a nice solid 30. I'm going to take a rope. Now this rope, it doesn't say anything about taking up two slots. So I'm going to ditch my bigger rope that I found that takes up two slots and just take this one slot rope. Still got my two slot towel. I'm loath to get rid of the towel. I'm also gonna take a bow, replacing my bone sword, and a quiver with six arrows. Six arrows. Alright. So what did I take? Waistcoat. Rope. Bow. Quiver. I can take one more thing. I might as well take another potion. Potion of Lomspur. There we go. And I have one slot left in my backpack, and one slot left in my special items. Now this explains how everything works, weapons, bow and arrows. This is a new feature starting in this book. During your adventure, there will be opportunities to use a bow and arrow. If you equip yourself with this weapon and you possess at least one arrow, you may use it when the text of a particular section allows you to do so. 
The bow is a useful weapon, for it enables you to hit an enemy at a distance. However, a bow cannot be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You must possess a quiver and at least one arrow. Each time the bow is used, erase an arrow. Bow can't be used if you have no arrows, but you may get some arrows back. So that so it'll be a special thing where it, it allows me to use the bow at certain times, basically. I don't use it in normal combat. Okay. And that's really uh, it for equipment. My combat skill went up by two, and my endurance went up by two, and I got some new tricks. And I have a bow now, so that's all pretty exciting. Moving forward, rules for combat have not changed. Here's the levels of Magna Chi training. As you see, I was a Kai Master, and I kind of skipped... I skipped over Kai Master Senior and I became a Kai Master Superior because I know three Magna Chi disciplines. And then with each additional one I learn, I gain a new rank all the way up to Kai Grand Master. There's the lore circles again. So let's see. Look, I almost have the Circle of Solaris. Because I have invisibility and I have pathmanship. And I said already that next time I'm going to take hunt mastery. So that means next book, when I take hunt mastery, I will complete this circle and I'll get one combat skill and three endurance, which is pretty awesome. Improved disciplines. This is another new thing they start doing in the Magna Chi books that's pretty cool. As you rise through the higher levels of Magna Chi training, you will find that each of your skills will steadily improve. For example, if you possess the discipline of divination when you reach the Kai rank of Scion Kai, you will be able to spirit walk and leave your body in a state of suspended animation as you explore your immediate surroundings unhindered by physical limitations. So basically each book will have a listing of new stuff that the disciplines can do based on your rank. It's pretty neat. Alright. Your quest for the Lower Stone of Veretta will be fraught with danger, for the lands that border upon the River Storn are wild and turbulent nations, constantly warring with one another. Where is the River Storn? Oh, I see. It's this big river coming down the middle here. May the Spirit of Sun Eagle guide you on the path of the Magna Chi. Alright, we're going to begin. Adjust my position, adjust my microphone, take a drink of water. Okay. <clears throat> Section one. <coughs> Excuse me. The beginning of the adventure proper. The courtyard of the Kai Monastery is strangely silent the morning you begin the quest. A blanket of frost sparkles on the battlements, and the air is crisp and clear as you guide your horse down the steep hill track that disappears into the Fryland Forest. It is only a little later when you look back to see the tall grey towers of your stronghold silhouetted against the sky. You bid a silent farewell before entering the densely packed trees. You do not look back again. The long ride south is not without incident. On Raiders Road, the highway between the capital and the province of Ruinon, you are confronted by a ragged outlaw band. They demand gold, but instead receive a harsh lesson in the powers of a Kai master. You fight them and they flee in confusion, leaving three of their number dead on the highway. After this encounter, you are given a wide berth by all the other unsavory characters of this bleak and desolate region. In Ruinon, you are greeted with a hero's welcome by the lord of the land, Baron Vanaland. He and his people will never forget the debt they owe you, for it was your courage that once saved them from destruction at the hands of an evil renegade warlord. That was back in Book 4, The Chasm of Doom. You are made so welcome by the Ruinese that your quest is in danger of being forgotten in the endless round of banquets and celebrations held in your honor. However, you cannot neglect your duty and the time soon comes for you to leave the mining town and venture south once more. 
Long ago, the highway from Ruinon to Quorlan was torn in two by a terrible earthquake that scarred the land for hundreds of miles. This deep crevasse became known as the Machen Gorge, the Chasm of Doom, for its fathomless depths are cursed with a dreadful legacy. It was here, during the Age of the Black Moon, that King Ulnar killed the mightiest of the Dark Lords, Lord Vashna, whose body, along with the bodies of all his followers, was cast down into its bottomless reach. The legends say that his death cry will echo through the gorge until he rises again to wreak his vengeance on Summerland and the House of Ulnar. You were eager to avoid the Chasm of Doom, and the long detour to the free city-state of Cassiorn is a far better prospect than a visit to the ghost city of Machen. Gradually, the fertile plain of southern Ruinon gives way to the sparse ve vegetation on the borders of the Dry Main. There, like a jewel rising out of the desert, lies the city-state of Cassiorn. Your stay in the City of Merchants is a brief but profitable one. A piece of luck, helped by your Kai skills, gives a profitable win at the Gambling House of the Silver Sage. So pretty much using Mind Over Matter to cheat at gambling. Honorable as fuck, those Kai Lords. With the gold you win, you replenish your supplies and purchase a fresh mount for your ride to Corlin. There is apparently a silhouette of uh, Cassiorn. A week later, you arrive safely at the outskirts of Quorlan, and, in the evening twilight, find yourself gazing upon the fortified wall that surrounds this river town. To reach Verretta, you must cross the river, and only here, at Quorlan, is there a bridge that spans the flast flowing waters of the Quarrel. The highway divides as it approaches the town wall, for there are two gates that provide access to its east side. I'm just taking another look at the map real quick. Quorlan. We are... We are here in this little town of Quorlan. We came from Cassiorn, which is off the map over here. And we just have to go from here to Veretta. It's a, it looks like a nice little short trip. So, I'm sure it'll be really easy and uneventful and safe. Alright, I do have passmanship actually, that's one of the ones I took, so let's check it out. Your Magna Chi skill tells you the meaning of a symbol carved into the stone above the south gatehouse. It is a winged spur, the emblem of the army of Lyris. This gate must be the entrance to a guardhouse, for the highway that leads to the north gate shows signs of more frequent use where its deeply rutted surface has borne the brunt of merchant traffic to and from Cassiorn. The tracks that mark the road here are only those of iron-shod horses. As the border guards of Lyris have a poor reputation for hospitality, it would be wise to avoid them if possible. So the guards are jerks. So... We want to take the north gatehouse which is the one that the merchants are going through. A peasant wagon and a merchant caravan bearing the Toa Tree emblem of Cassiorn are waiting in front of the town gate. You bring your horse to a halt and wait in line as the great door of rust red iron slowly creaks open. A guard appears and gestures to the wagon and caravan to enter, but he lowers his spear menacingly as you prepare to follow. The town levy is three gold crowns, stranger. Pay or turn away. I'll pay. It's only three gold. I have 50. Done. So I give him three crowns. You enter a wide street where black iron lanterns swing above the doors of shops and houses, their oily black smoke staining the walls and adding a pall of gloom to the darkening sky. The street descends toward the river Quarrel, where flatboats lie moored at the rich merchant wharves. Quarland stands at the most northerly point on the river that can be navigated by boat and barge, and it is here that the river meets the caravan routes to Cassiorn and the Last Lands, so ensuring the future of the town. At the approach to a wide stone bridge, you see an impressive looking hostelry, with stables and outhouses. A painted shield hangs above the courtyard gate, proudly displaying its name, 
The Barrel Bridge Tavern. The moment you enter the courtyard, a stable boy appears from nowhere and bids you welcome. He takes charge of your horse and shows you the door to the tavern hall. It is crowded despite the early hour, and a roaring fire blazes in its great stone hearth. The smell of roasting beef makes your mouth water, reminding you that you have not eaten today. Um, I have Magna Chi, Discipline of Passmanship, and Divination. Let's use it. Seated near to the fireplace are three surly-faced drinkers, their tunics stained with the grime of travel. Each wears a red badge upon their breast, embroidered with the crossed swords of Veretta. You sense that they are soldiers of fortune, probably in the pay of a captain who comes from the same city. Uh, I'll join the men and perhaps find out more about Veretta. There's a helmet, and a mug, and a short sword. The soldiers are swilling ale and reminiscing about their campaigns with wild exaggeration. They are brash and loud, but an uneasy silence quickly falls when they see you approach. You notice that their hands are no longer grasping mugs of ale. They now rest upon the hilts of their heavy bladed swords. I'm gonna buy him a drink. That's how you get in good with these people. Offer to buy them a drink. The three men exchange wary glances before offering you a seat. A pockmarked warrior snaps his fingers and shouts across the crowded hall, WENCH! FOUR FLAGONS OF ALE! Beer is drawn into four large earthenware vessels, each of which holds half a gallon of ale. <laughs> wow. Those are some serious flagons. Staggering beneath their weight, the serving girl finally arrives. Yeah, she's carrying, what, two gallons on a, on a tray or something? That'd be pretty heavy for, a, you know, somebody that's not really strong. The serving girl finally arrives and places the flagons on the table. Although I would imagine she is pretty, probably pretty strong if she's constantly carrying around, you know, multiple half gallons on a tray, like as a regular thing, then she's got to be pretty strong. Eight gold crowns, sir, she says breathlessly, the perspiration standing out on her freckled brow. I'll pay for the ale. What the hell? I never get to spend gold. I just lose it by being robbed or something or, or captured. I never actually get to spend it on anything. I have 39 left. A toast to our gallant friend, cries the soldier with the pockmarked face. Honor in battle, shouts the red-haired man to his left. And a rich purse for the victor, retorts the other. They laugh heartily and raise the flagons to their lips. Their smiling faces are completely hidden by the jugs as they drink their fill. A full minute of silence passes before the three jugs are slammed to the table, emptied of ale. Those guys just chugged down a half a gallon each, huh? That's intense. The strong beer soon dissolves any guardedness, and they become very talkative about themselves. You take this opportunity to ask them what they know of the lore stone of Veretta. Legend! Belches the redhead. Myth or legend? Not so! Interrupts Pockface. It's real enough, but it was lost years ago! The lore stone is magical. It holds a power that can turn an ordinary man into a king. There's a picture of a glowing scepter or mace. On hearing this, the other soldiers snigger, but Pockface ignores them and continues. The lore stone was once set into the throne of Lyris at the tower of the king in Veretta. Hundreds of years ago, during the War of the Lore Stone, it was still- Why does this guy know all this lore? This guy, Wikipedia man over here, how does he know all this? Hundreds of years ago, during the War of the Lore Stone, it was stolen by a Salonese prince called Kasker. He set the stone upon a gold scepter and used it in battle to inspire his followers. He believed that it made him invulnerable, but it was not so. He was killed in a battle on board his royal barge at Rem. 
and the lore stone was lost when it fell from his hand into the depths of the river Storm. However, that is not the end of the story. There are many tales about the scepter having been found, but on the whole, they turn out to be fake or merely fanciful. The legend says whoever wields this lore stone is the rightful ruler of all the Stormlands. For this reason above all others, the lore stone is sought by many evil or unscrupulous men to further their dreams of power. This doesn't sound like the way some mercenary would talk. Come on, I'm not buying this guy. He's not a real mercenary. This guy is some kind of traveling spy or, or lore master incognito. If you wish to know more, you should go to Veretta. There are many learned men who have devoted their lives to the study of the lore stone. The scholars and sages of Brass Street. See, he, why does he know about these scholars of Brass Street? This dude's not on the up and up. Pockface. Pockface is, is no simple mercenary, I tell you. They're the people to help you. You thank the quote-unquote soldier for his help and take your leave of the company. Um... Now I'll order some food. What the fuck? I mean, I'll just hang out and spend all my money. I don't care. I don't care. I'm doing it up. This is my only time to hang out in a tavern and buy stuff and just relax, so... You choose a seat near the corner, one that is laid for dinner and offers a clear view of the hall. A serving girl soon appears carrying a platter laden with roasted meat, and she proceeds to stack a generous helping on your plate. Two gold crowns, if you please, sir. She says, presenting an open hand, bloodied by the food. You pay. Remember to deduct the crowns. Yeah. And settle down to your feast. While you are eating, you are approached by the innkeeper. He is a fat, oily individual with small, piggish eyes. My lad tells me that he's tended to your mare. She's in good hands here. The best stables in all of quarreling. The man shifts nervously from one foot to the other, as if he's uncomfortable in your presence. You'll be wanting a room, I take it? You finish a mouthful of food before nodding your reply. We're in luck, my friend. He answers, obviously relieved that you've turned out to be a paying guest. We have one room left. Room 17. He produces a plain iron key from his apron pocket and sets it down beside your plate. That'll be three grow crowns, sir, in advance. You pay the innkeeper and slip the key into your pocket. Fine, three more gold crowns, whatever. I've already managed to spend 16. Can I go back to the monastery and get mine now? Okay. Suddenly, there is a mighty crash as the hall door is slammed shut. Into the tavern strides a black-browed young lordling, wearing a flamboyant costume of ebony and gold. He makes a ceremonious display of removing his velvet cloak and pompously demands food and wine, and it takes three serving girls and the innkeeper to see to his wishes. His manner is so insulting that you are not surprised to see the many scars that dif disfigure his young face. He must be continually provoking fights and duels. The lordling chooses to seat himself at a table already occupied by a small, thin, inoffensive old man. Within seconds there is a thunderous outburst of foul language. The lordling grabs the old man by the throat, lifts him one-handedly from his seat, and hurls him to the floor. You sniveling toad! How dare you sit with me! He bellows. And here's our picture of the scarred... Obnoxious asshole lordling. Well, this dude is looking for some comeuppance. This motherfucker's looking for a showdown. I'm just saying, he's about to have one more scar. His hat's even coming off, he's so angry. Bewildered and frightened, the little man fumbles an apology, but to no avail. The lordling kicks back his chair and towers over the wretch his hand clasped around the hilt of his sword. The tavern crowd view the scene with relish, like spectators at a Vasagonian arena, for the lordling clearly intends to kill the old man. Man, this guy is a piece of shit. I do have a bow, actually. I just got one. I'm about to do some green arrow shit. Shoot the sword out of his hand or something.
With the speed and grace of movement that marks you as a Kai Master, you load, take aim, and fire. Your arrow pierces the Lordling's forearm as his sword descends, causing the blow to splinter stone, not skull. He utters a shrill cry and spins backwards, cradling his wounded arm as he falls. Curse you, scum! He shrieks. I am Rourke, Highborn of Amory! I shall have your life for this! Mark my words! Trembling with pain and fury, he staggers to his feet and demands his cloak from the innkeeper before stumbling into the night with a welter of threats and curses. Nice, I guess I gotta mark off an arrow. Just shot that dude in the arm. My humble thanks, says the frail old man as you help him to his feet. I am forever in your debt. Taking him by the arm, you escort him to his table where he gathers up his scattered belongings. My name is Cyrillus. I'm a magician, he says meekly as if apologizing for some weakness or abnormality. I claim no great understanding of the arcane. My talents are modest by any standard. I only dabble in simple tricks, earning my keep with amusements and sleights of hand to amuse the courtiers of Veretta. Your eyes obviously betray you. The old man is quick to note your sudden interest in the word Veretta. Of course I'm going to ask him about the lore stone. He probably doesn't know as much as that quote-unquote mercenary earlier, but we'll see. Let's ask him about the lore stone. The old man narrows his mousy eyes and looks at you with a cautious stare. It is but a legend. Some say it contained great power. Others say its power existed only in the minds of those who craved to own it. Whatever the truth is, the lore stone has been lost for hundreds of years. You sense that the old magician is not telling you all he knows about the lore stone. Ooh. Do I want to identify myself and tell him of my quest? I'm supposed to be secretive here. I'm not going to reveal my identity. Because I'm supposed to be keeping this mission a secret. So I'm going to bid him good night and turn to 239. As you wait, Cyrillus becomes agitated. You sense that he is scared to be left on his own after his encounter with Rourke. Are you bound for Veretta? He asks. Perhaps we can share the journey? I'm bound for the capital in the morning. I know the road very well, and I know its dangers. It would not be wise to travel alone on such a road. You pause to consider the prospect of sharing your journey with this old man. On the one hand, his company would make the miles seem shorter. But on the other hand, he could prove to be a burden and slow you down. You are about to decline when he says something that convinces you to share the journey. At page 319. We can't sixth sense this guy, huh? You seek the lore stone, do you not? He says in a hushed tone. I cannot tell you where it is, but I know a man who can. Let me ride with you to Veretta. And in return, I shall take you to this man. Your basic Kai instincts tell you that this man speaks the truth. You nod your agreement and arrange to meet in the tavern courtyard at dawn. Alright. Cool, so I did six sense him a little bit, and he's fine. He checks out. Story checks out. A shrill cock crow heralds the break of day. By the time you have dressed and gathered together your equipment, Cyrillus is waiting for you in the courtyard below. A glorious day, he says cheerfully, pointing up at the cloudless sky with his slender oaken staff. We'll have no difficulty reaching the halfway inn by nightfall. You bid farewell to the innkeeper and his son and urge your horses out onto the narrow street that leads to the west gatehouse. By mid-morning, you are riding across gentle hills crested with yellow-leaved trees. The hilltops are shrouded with mist, but occasional rays of sunshine break through to lighten the lush green fields below. Time passes swiftly as Cyrillus recounts the histories and legends of the area. 
you learn that the rich and fertile kingdoms bordering the river Storn have a wild and turbulent past, swept by wars, divided by empires, split by national rivalries, and the ambitions of petty princes who prey upon one another and the rest of the populace. Lyris is embroiled in war with Magador, Delden with Salony, and Salony with Slovia. Battles are fought, lives are lost, and the land is pillaged with grim regularity. Only the mercenaries and the crows seem to prosper from the continual conflicts. We've got a random picture of, you know, conflict happening. It is mid-afternoon when you catch sight of a small village on the road ahead. There are many wagons parked at the side of the highway, and a crowd has gathered in a field nearby. As you ride past, you notice a large placard nailed to one of the wagons. Archery Tournament. Entrance fee, two gold crowns. First prize, the Silver Bow of Duodon. Oh, I'm, I'm entering this. You bet your ass I am. Alright, so two, two gold crowns. Marked off. I'm spending money like a motherfucker, this book. I'm glad I started with 50. Cyrillus offers to stay and look after the horses while you take part in the contest. He says that archery holds no interest for him, but you suspect this is just an excuse to take an afternoon nap. You hand in the reins of your horse and hurry to join a line of men waiting to enter the tournament field. The event reminds you of a Somlending village pageant, and the jugglers, the dancers, and the numerous sideshows all add to the festive spirit. Eventually, you reach the gate where a cheerful old lady is collecting the two gold crowns entrance fee. You hand over your crowns and enter a large tent where the other competitors are stringing their bows. If you do not have a bow, it would be pretty obnoxious to come try to answer this if you didn't have a bow, but I do have a bow. A small, flat-faced man dressed in a silver-braided jerkin enters the tent and calls for everyone's attention. Quickly, he explains the rules that govern the tournament and then ushers you onto the stage. At the far end of the field is a line of targets, each with ten colored rings marked zero through nine. That's convenient. That just happens to be the random numbers you can generate in this game. And <laughs> they just happen to be marked zero through nine. Each arch archer is given three arrows with which he must get a minimum score of eight in order to qualify for the next round of the tournament. Pick three numbers at random and add them together. If you have the discipline of mag weapon mastery with bow, add three to your total. I don't have that. All right, so three numbers. Here we go. Number one, a nine. I already, I already got it. Let's move on. A zero. That's not good. And another zero! If I hadn't rolled super high on the first one, those two zeros would have sunk me. So basically, I fired the first arrow right into the bullseye, and the other two arrows barely hit the edge of the target. That's embarrassing. Eight or higher, let's do this. Your score qualifies you for a place in the final, for only one other archer has scored more than eight points. His name is Alton. A tall man with rugged features, a ranger from the mountains to the north. He wields a longbow of orange toa wood, and his skill with this weapon is formidable. It will be a difficult contest. I remember this guy now. Like, like I said in one of my YouTube comments, I don't remember anything about what happens in these books, or who you meet, or different scenes and stuff. I don't remember them all, because it's been so year. But as soon as I see them again, as I'm reading through this, I instantly remember them again, and go like, Oh yeah, I remember this guy. Oh yeah, I remember this picture. You know, these images, these Gary Chalk images, like, stuck in my head. And as soon as I see them again, I feel this, like, nostalgia and, and all this memory. I remember this guy. Oh, I actually have to fight him. How does this work? He has a lot of combat skill, holy shit. And a lot of endurance. Well, that's target points, quote-unquote. The tournament final is played out using the normal rules for combat. The only difference is that you begin with 50 endurance or target points. Any endurance points that you may lose are deducted from these target points, your normal endurance score remaining unchanged throughout the contest. The first one to lose all 50 of his target points loses the tournament. And I don't have to use up any of my arrows. For this combat, you may not gain bonuses from a shield or any weapon other than a bow. Weapon Mastery with a bow grants you the combat skill bonus. A 
if I'm using the Jacan, I don't know what that is. So, um, so setting this battle up is going to be a little bit tricky. I need to alter. Well, all right, I need to temporarily make my endurance 44 so that I have 50. And I need to temporarily take off all my weapon skill bonus. I'm going to have... Oh, he's going to kick my ass. Because without the bonuses for my sword and my shield, I only have 15 combat skill. And he has 28. He's going to wreck me in this contest. He would wreck anyone in this contest. How could you possibly beat him? Like, let's say I had weapon skill with bow, I'd have an 18 here. If I had rolled higher on my thing, I might have up to 22. He'd still probably beat you. Alright, well let's just see how it plays out. Here we go. Can I use Mind Blast on him while we're doing this contest? <laughs> Doesn't say I can't. <laughs> Probably shouldn't though. That'd kind of be cheating. So I won't. All right, 50 and 50. Oh, first round went to me. I got lucky. He lost six. I lost none. Second round, 50 and 44. Ooh, I lost eight. He lost none. 42, 44. I lost eight. He lost none. 34, 44. 34, 38. He lost six. I lost none. If I, if I roll, if I get lucky rolls, I could win. 34, 38. 30, 34, we both lost four. 30, 34. We both lost four. 26, 30. I lost five, he lost three. That's not good. 21, 27. Oh my god, he insta-beat me! He insta-beat me that time! Damn. Well, okay. I'm not good at archery contests, apparently. Alright, let's go back here. And set ourselves back up like we're supposed to be. 27 combat skill, 30 endurance. Back to normal. Yeah, Alton smoked me. A loud cheer shatters the silence as Alton's winning arrow hits the target. The villagers are thrilled to have witnessed such an exciting tournament and surge across the field, eager to offer Alton their praise and congratulations. As the tall woodsman disappears from view amid the teeming crowd, you take the opportunity to slip away unnoticed. In shame, I take the opportunity to, to go feel shame and, and sorrow. Just had to throw that in there because that's about that's about where we're at. All right, shame and sorrow and sadness. Let's uh, use the borrowed bow for the tournament. You must return it to the tent before making your way back to Cyrillus. No, I didn't use a borrowed bow. I used my own, and I lost with my own bow. Man, it sure would have been cool to win that silver bow of whatever, but that didn't happen. Turn to 33. A shock awaits you on your return to Cyrillus. Both he and your horse have vanished. At first you curse him, thinking that he has wandered off to a nearby ale tent for a drink. But when you discover his oaken staff lying beside the road, you sense that something is seriously wrong. You climb to the top of a parked wagon and strain your eyes in all directions for some clue to his whereabouts. Suddenly you see him surrounded by a group of cavalrymen galloping away to the west. You count six of them plus a riderless horse, your horse. Then you notice that conveniently hitched to the back of the parked wagon is a saddled horse. Oh, that is convenient. Uh, am I stealing this horse or am I going to try to buy it? Well, I mean, obviously Lone Wolf uses his powers to cheats at gambling, so... 
don't know. I mean, there really isn't time for this. There really isn't time to go find the horse's owner. I think it's just horse stealing time. A, a man's life is at stake, right? I mean, I have an excuse. I'm stealing the horse. You have barely covered a hundred yards when you hear a frantic cry. Of course you do. Horse thief! Horse thief! Don't let him get away! You tighten your grip and urge the horse along the highway as it dips and bends, following the low hedgerow that borders the tournament field. The cry alerts some men from the archery competition, and they soon appear in a line at the edge of the field. As they see you approach, they draw their bows to fire. Oh, I just got myself in trouble. I don't have animal control or hunt mastery, so I don't get to add three to my number. I really want to roll a six or higher. Here we go. I got a six! Yes! Arrows scream past on all sides. One shaft gouges a furrow of skin from the horse's rump, causing him to twist and buck. You shorten the reins and urge him forward. Your quick thinking helps you regain control of the frightened animal, and soon you are well out of range of the deadly arrows. Oh, that's good. Good thing Alton wasn't shooting at me. I would have been doomed. The chase takes you deep into the heart of the Varesian Hills. Soon, the highway dips and twists, plunging into the valleys and hollows carved by flat, fast flowing streams and climbing through the dense woodland that clings precariously to every precipice and crag. You often lose sight of the riders, but your basic Kai skills of tracking and hunting enable you to follow their trail with ease. It is not until you reach a tiny village perched on the edge of a tree-lined crag that their trail becomes indistinct. However, you notice that at the far side of the village, a stony hill track branches from the main highway and ascends into the trees. And I do have pathsmanship, thank you, for just these sort of situations. Using your Magna Chi discipline, you examine both the hill path and the highway for recent tracks. To your surprise, you discover that neither route has been used by horsemen in the last three hours. It could mean only one thing. The riders are hiding somewhere in the village. Right into the village. Oh, hide in the trees and wait for the riders to show themselves sounds like my kind of style. You do not have to wait very long for the riders to appear. As soon as they think you have gone, they emerge in single file from the back of a derelict cottage and draw themselves into a circle in the middle of the village. Although they are out of earshot, you can tell by their frantic movements and gestures that they are having a heated argument. Suddenly, they break the circle and ride towards you. Cyrillus, still lying unconscious across his horse, is in tow behind the last rider. Alright, I could use my bow, but you know what? I'm feeling so ashamed of my loss at the archery tournament that I don't want to use my bow. I want to attack the last rider and try to recapture Cyrillus. With bated breath, you wait for the enemy to pass. As the last man rides into view, you break cover and attack him with deadly efficiency. He tries to raise a shield to block your blow, but cannot react in time to save his life. As he tumbles to the ground, you cut the reins from his saddle and take off along the highway with the unconscious wizard in tow. Like a boss. Just black ops that shit. The other guys didn't even notice. Your immediate peril stops you dwelling too much on the reason why these riders should try to abduct Cyrillus. However, it does occur to you that he is neither wealthy nor powerful, and so a poor prospect for a rich ransom. Oh, and here's Rourke again on his on his horse, looking all bajiggity. I'll fucking kill you, Rourke. Don't act up. You're on borrowed time, sir. As you reach the bottom of the wooded crag, a stone church and graveyard loom into view at a point where the highway turns sharply to the west. Blocking the road on a charger as black as midnight sits a scar-faced young man. His eyes, set in a white and disfigured face, burn with a cold, dark glow. You recognize him immediately. 
It is Rourke, the lordling you defeated at the Barrel Bridge Tavern. I do not have a silver brooch, nor do I know where I would have gotten one. Suddenly, the riders appear and spread out in a semicircle to surround you. We have a debt to settle, Northlander! hisses Rourke, his lips drawn back from his teeth in a contemptuous sneer. I demand payment in full! Madness flashes in his glaring eyes as he removes an amulet from around his neck and holds it high in the air. Come! Come, Tagazin! I summon thee! From the pit of eternal pain, I summon thee! That doesn't sound good. The pit of eternal pain? The skin on your arms and neck prickles with dread at the sound of Rourke's terrible invocation, and you cast your eyes around you for an escape route. Only the churchyard offers a way past Rourke and his men, but as you spur your horse through the stone gateway, you are suddenly frozen with terror by what you see before you. Alright, I'm a little concerned. Anything that lives in a place called the Pit of Eternal Pain is probably not your homie. Above the church, a whirlpool of darkness is taking form, casting a tomb-like chill on everything beneath. Frost crystallizes on the grass and flowers, and a terrible sound fills the air as the earth begins to shake. Cracks appear in the ground beneath you, and suddenly a score of fleshless hands burst through the frozen soil to grab your horse. Shrieking with terror, it rears up, and you are thrown into the waiting arms of the waking dead. They're kind of like the walking dead, but, uh, you know, they're just getting up. And there's... <laughs> dead just kind of... He's just sticking the top of his head out with his... Just so he can peek with his little eyeball, like... Eh? What's going on up there? Undead Summonation! Okay, due to the surprise of the attack, deduct two points from your combat skill for the first two rounds of combat, unless you have the Magna Kai Discipline of Hunt Mastery. I don't. The undead are immune to Psy Surge and Mind Blast. Also, unless you possess the Magna Kai Discipline of Nexus, you must deduct two Endurance points for every round of combat you fight due to the intense cold. If you wield the Summer Sword in this combat, you may double all endurance point losses inflicted upon your enemy because undead. So, first two rounds, I basically need to lower my combat skill a little bit. And I have to take an extra two damage each time. Okay, 18. 35, taking double damage. Let's do this. I, I should destroy this thing. 30 and 35. I lost none. It lost, you know, basically 18. Lost 18. Round 2. I lost none. It lost all the rest. And that was down 2 combat skill. Thanks for playing, though, on Dead Semination. Really, it was fun. I redeemed myself after my terrible archery loss to Alton. Come back up to normal, thanks. Didn't even get scratched! As you destroy the last of the fleshless skeletons, you see that the struggle has spread beyond the walls of the churchyard. From the depths of an open crypt, a shambling mass of zombies are hurling themselves at the riders, tearing the terrified warriors from their saddles. Rourke's summonation has gone horribly out of control. No living creature is safe from the terror he has unleashed. Fucking Rourke. I knew that guy was trouble. The Lordling turns and gallops away in blind panic, leaving his followers to their grisly deaths. As he disappears, the swirling funnel of darkness slowly fades, and the undead stagger and fall, crumbling into dust, which is carried away on the evening breeze. You rush to the aid of the old magician, who lies mortally wounded, pinned beneath the body of his dead horse. As you cradle his head in your hands, his eyes flicker and open, and he forces a whisper from his blood-flecked lips. Brass Street. Oh, I don't have curing. I didn't take curing. I have healing, but I don't have curing. I think we might be at the cover art, by the way. This is the cover art, isn't it? We're working with... We're working with the... All the skeletons that I'm holding the body in my arms, that must be him. 
That must be Cyrillus. Wow, we got to the cover art really quick in this game. I'm looking off in the, to the distance like, Rourke, I will kill the shit out of you. I don't possess Skiring, I'm sorry. A trickle of blood seeped from the corner of the old man's mouth as his eyes flicker and close. He is dead. You bury him in the graveyard of the church where he fell, and say a silent prayer to the spirits of the Kai to watch over him on his final journey. A sadness fills your heart, and you take one last look at the oaken staff that marks his grave before setting off on the highway to Veretta. You will be missed, Cyrillus. Well, not that much, really, but still. Sorry I let you die, okay? So I just, I basically told this guy I'd protect him on the way to Veretta, failed, let him die. Also failed at the archery contest. Lone Wolf, now that he's become a Magna Kai, is kind of sucking up the place. It is nearly dark when you catch sight of a tavern on the road ahead. Two guttering torches set into rusty brackets illuminate the sign nailed above the door. The Halfway Inn. You recognize the name of the tavern that Cyrillus spoke of this morning, and it grieves you that he is not here to accompany you. Distant thunder rumbles through the hills as you stable your horse and enter the welcoming warmth of the tap room. The tavern is alive with the chatter of merchants, the clink of glasses, and the crackle of a blazing fire. The center of the room is dominated by a small stage on which a conjurer is performing his tricks to the delight of his customers. The customers. I'll watch The Conjurer. Why not? Probably gonna get my pockets picked or something. Having removed a bunch of flowers from the ear of a startled merchant, and a clucking hen from the petticoat of the merchant's wife, the flamboyantly dressed Conjurer calls for silence from his cheering audience before announcing his next trick. Two children shuffle onto the stage, their bodies and faces completely hidden by long black gowns that are tied at their foreheads. Only their hair, blonde and black, is visible. I'm a boy, says the one with black hair. I'm a girl, says the one with blonde hair, the voice identical to the first. The conjurer steps forward and says that they are a boy and a girl but at least one of them is lying. He asks which is which, and invites the audience to bet on the answer. Okay, if one of them is lying, the other one has to be lying, right? Like, let's say that I'm a boy. The one says he's, says he's a boy. If he's lying, that means he's actually a girl, which means the one saying a girl must actually be a boy. So if they're both lying, that means both of them are simply the opposite of what they said they are. Which means I know which one is which. Black hair... Black hair is a girl, blonde hair is a boy. I will bet on this conundrum. Black hair is a girl. First, decide how many gold crowns you wish to wager, and note this down in the margin of your action chart. H how many can I wager? I'll wager a million. Well, no. I'll wager... 18. Exactly 18, because that would bring me back up to max of 50 if I win. You consider the problem and decide that there can only be four possible combinations, and you repeat the conundrum under your breath before making your decision. I'm a boy, said the one with black hair. I'm a girl, said the one with blonde hair. Both children lied. Both children lied. There's no other way it could possibly be. You are correct. The boy has blonde hair and the girl has black hair. Your logical thinking revealed they could not both have been speaking the truth, for the conjurer has said that at least one of them was lying. And if one was lying, then the other could not have been speaking the truth. Therefore, there was only one conclusion to be drawn. Both lied. The conjurer pays you the number of gold crowns equal to that which you wagered. That's what I'm talking about. Max me back out, sir. Easy peasy. Remember to add this sum to your current total of gold crowns before approaching the bar and inquiring about a room for the night. Let's go do that. Looks like... Looks as like you made it here just in time! 
says the cheerful innkeeper, pointing to a rain-streaked window pane. It's going to be a rough night tonight, not mistaken. You discover that a room for the night costs two gold crowns, plus one gold crown for your horse's keep. A meal of black bread and hard-boiled eggs will cost you another gold crown. Unless you choose to eat a meal from your backpack, you must in any case eat a meal now. Now, I think I could use hunting here, and I could get this meal for free. Because I've been traveling, and, and I, I know I can use hunting. But I'm going to buy the meal anyway, because it seems like role-playing-wise that I'd rather buy a meal in the tavern while I'm here. So, it's just another gold. So that's two, three, four gold. Whatever. I just... I just won 18. Back down to 46. Um, right, so meal has been eaten. And I'm paying for a night's lodging. You collect your key and climb the stairs to your room at the top of the tavern. You sleep deeply and at dawn rise from your narrow bed to shiver in the fresh breeze whistling through a cracked window pane. As the harsh light of morning floods the tiny garret, you see to your dismay that your backpack lies half open on the floor. A gaping hole has been gnawed from the flap, the unmistakable handiwork of rats. Any meals you had in your backpack have been eaten or ruined. Erase them from your action chart before leaving the tavern and collecting your horse. I didn't have any meals. Nope. I had a towel though, but they didn't fuck up my towel. The air is sweet with the smell of wet grass. The sun rises above the trees to the east, and mist steams from the hills on either side of the highway. By noon, you reach a small village where brightly decorated cottages line a cobblestoned square. A shrine with an enormous onion-shaped dome stands in the middle of the square, and in its shadow sit a group of old women. They are tending to some shrubs with bright orange berries, which grow in the shade. I don't possess curing. Damn it. I will stop and investigate the shrine, though. The women smile as you dismount and approach the shrine. Welcome, Bray, sir. Welcome to the shrine of the warrior. You come in search of our sacred crop, do you not? Says a rosy-cheeked matron as he dusts the leafy shrubs with a square of silk. The fruit of our Alther plant will give you strength in battle, says another, and offers you a handful of the small orange berries. Um... Sh sure, I'll purchase some Alather berries. I remember there were potions of Alather in the last book that gave you bonus to combat skill, so it seems legit. A handful of Alather berries cost three gold crowns. If you swallow them before a fight, they will increase your combat skill by two points for the duration of the fight. You may purchase up to three handfuls of Alather berries. Each handful counts as one backpack item, but you cannot swallow more than one handful during any one combat. When you concluded your purchases, you remount your horse and leave the village. Um, alright, I'll buy one handful. Alather berries plus two CS for one fight. And that's going to cost me three crowns. Back down to 43. Turn to 100. It is late afternoon when you catch your first breathtaking glimpse of Veretta. Built on a massive plateau, this city has stood since time immemorial. The walls and buildings are immense, constructed from blood-red rock and crowded together in complicated splendor. Great stone dragons writhe along the battlements, their coiled tails entangling the gatehouses and portals of the outer wall and spirals of smoke rise from the mouths of angry-faced gargoyles, crouching like spies on top of the roofs and towers that fill the city. And there's a picture of 
one of the dragons on the walls, and this is what the guards look like, very twin-plumed fancy helms and such. The sun is set by the time you reach the east gate. The red-coated guards offer no challenge, and you pass into the wide streets of this magnificent city to arrive eventually at a quadrangle. A pillar of red stone indicates the names of the streets that lead away from the square. Helen Way, Coach Chorus, or Flute Street. Or I can go east along the street down which you've just ridden. Um... What happens if I go east? About a hundred yards from the east gate th through which you entered the city, you notice a brass plaque fixed with polished brass spikes to the top of an arched doorway. The sign reads, Guild of the City Criers. I can dismount and enter the doorway. If I do not wish to, I can continue to the east gate, where two streets lead away from the gatehouse. I'll dismount and enter the doorway. Let's check this guild out. Beyond the doorway, a flight of narrow stone steps leads to a small room. Books line two of the walls from floor to ceiling, and another wall is filled with racks of scrolls, handbells, and parchments bound round with ribbons of green silk. Then, in the remaining wall, a door opens, and a tiny creature with unblinking crimson eyes bids you welcome. Instantly you recognize the stunted features of a cloon. Good evening, sir, it says in a strong voice that belies its small squat body. Welcome to our guild house. How may we be of assistance? Or I'm making up words that aren't in the book. How may we be of service? Uh, let's ask it about the lore stone of Veretta. The green-skinned cloon stares at you, the trace of a sneer playing on its thick, rubbery lips. Wait here, he says offhandedly, and waddles out through the door, slamming it shut as he leaves. Let me use the Kai discipline of divination. You sense that the cloon is deeply insulted and has gone to fetch his pet, a very ferocious Vasagonian warhound. As the warhound has not been fed for over two days, it is very unlikely that it will listen to reason. Without a moment's hesitation, you decide to leave the guildhouse before the cloon and his hungry hound return. A few hundred yards along the street is the east gate through which you entered the city. Two streets lead away from the gatehouse, one heading north, the other south. I'm feeling north. You pass many soldiers of dis different races and nationalities, lolling in open doorways or squatting against the red brick walls. They are mercenaries, drawn to Veretta by the news of war in the north. They come in search of employment, for the chance to sell their skills to any buyer, indifferent to the justness of his cause. That's pretty much what mercenary means. Beneath a black iron lantern, you notice a group of men throwing dice against the side of a wall. I'll stop and ask them the way to Brass Street. At first, they pretend not to have noticed you, but eventually a stubbly-faced soldier deigns to answer. Let the dice decide, he says, his face red and glowing in the light of the lantern. He raises his hand, spits on his palm, and throws the bone dice against the wall. Pick it a number. Five. Got a five. Wow, did not your lucky night, stranger. The dice command me to hold my tongue. He and his swarthy companions turn their backs on you and laugh as they continue their game. You shrug your shoulders and press on along the crowded street. Fine, I didn't want to know anyway, motherfuckers. Okay, I did, but... A wagon draws up beside an empty fountain. Its tailgate flaps down to reveal a cargo of freshly baked bread, and a rush of hungry soldiers flood around like bees to honey, 
desperate to buy some of the mouth-watering fare. You have not eaten today, and the delicious smell wakens your sleeping appetite. The loaves are two gold crowns each, and each loaf counts as one meal. You may purchase as many loaves as you wish. Unless I eat a meal now, I will lose three endurance points. Fine, I'll buy a loaf of bread and eat it. Lone Wolf is eating a lot in this adventure. You arrive at a tavern, but one that looks more like a huge banqueting hall than a city alehouse. The Inn of the Crossed Swords is the largest and noisiest tavern you have ever seen. A constant flow of soldiers pour in and out of its cathedral-like doors, and the adjoining stable is large enough to house the horses of an entire army. And there's a guy blindfolded with an apple on his head. You stable your horse and enter the tavern just in time to witness a spectacular event. The middle of the hall has been cleared to allow a horse and rider to gallop the full length of the building, and bets are being laid on the rider's skill at skewering fruit on the point of his lance. It reminds you of part of the training taught to Kai lords in preparation for battle, but unlike the Kai horse trials, there is more than just skill and the honor of the rider at stake here. In a line along the length of the hall kneel ten soldiers from the same regiment as the rider, men accused of cowardice in battle. The fruits the rider must skewer are resting on their heads. If he makes the slightest mistake, the men will lose their lives and, more importantly to the mercenaries, all the money the regiment has wagered on the skill of the rider. Do I want to bet on this deadly game? Talk to one of the barmaids or sit on one of the tables? Um, boy. I don't think I want any piece of this. I'm gonna talk to one of the barmaids. Patiently you wait for one of the overworked tavern girls to notice you, but before you can raise your hand and attract her attention, you are suddenly aware of the sharp point of a dagger being pressed against your spine. You purse your life, whispers the swarthy-faced mercenary who has appeared at your side. Make your mind up quickly, or my friend may be a little careless with his knife. I don't have hunt mastery. I'm not going to hand over all my gold crowns without resistance. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, I decide to refuse these men their demand and fight them. Shit, yes. You pull away and unsheathe your weapon in one swift, fluid movement. The dagger grazes your side. Lose one endurance point. Okay. But you manage to avoid being seriously wounded. Both men sneer maliciously as they close in for the kill. You cannot evade them and must fight them both as one enemy. Alright, <laughs> these guys don't know who they're fucking with. This is about to be pretty one-sided, I have a feeling. Oh, and Mind Blast. Just to, just to add insult to injury. Alright, here we go, round one. I lost two, they lost twelve. Round two. I lost two, they lost eleven. Round three. I lost two, they're dead. They did manage to hurt me, though. They took seven endurance off me. But then they died. Brutally. I'll start healing myself, it's no big deal. Your speedy dispatch of the robbers has earned you five gold crowns, which you find in the pockets of the dead men. I love the idea that Lone Wolf killed these two guys and immediately just started searching them for money. <laughs> like... And the respectful glances of several mercenary captains. One in particular is so impressed by your fighting prowess that he approaches you and offers to buy you a drink. You sense that it is an honest gesture of friendship without any hidden threat, and gratefully accept his offer. The captain is an imposing man, tall, muscular, with a strong jawed face, unmarked by battle or disease. His blonde hair is cropped close to his head, and likewise his beard and mustache are trimmed close to his tanned skin. You are invited to join his company, and as you drink your ale, you listen to their proud talk of war, of victories, of loot, and wages, 
but never of defeat. The captain and his men have grown tired of the war in the north. Prince Janviel of Helen is close to ruin, having sold all he owns to pay for a war against Baron Magau of Carcast that he cannot hope to win. The prince's troops are demoralized, and his mercenaries desert him at the first opportunity. You learn that the captain is recruiting men for a campaign in the south. The war between Salony and Slovia has reached boiling point, and there is much gold to be had in the service of the Salonese prince Euvin while he besieges the city of Takaro. You have the mean of a skilled warrior. You have the mean of a skillful warrior, says the captain, his steel blue eyes cold and unblinking. Why not join my company? I have need of fighters, and I pay with gold, not promises. We leave for Takaro at dawn. Will you ride with us? Politely you refuse the captain's offer, saying that you have come to Veretta on other business. What business is there for a warrior other than war? retorts the captain, to the raucous delight of his men. You finish your ale and bid the captain and his company good night. If you change your mind, join us at Sorin. We sail the river from there in two days' time. I don't have a map of Veretta. Your thoughts return to your quest and to Cyrillus's dying words. The man he was taking you to meet lives in Brass Street, but in a city the size of Veretta, it could take you days to find the right street. You decide to try to find out where it is from someone in the tavern, and look around the massive hall in search of a likely source of information. Why wouldn't I just ask the dudes I was just hanging out with? Apparently I didn't think they would know. Hold up. That's one. One, two... A couple more healing points. Approach a merchant who sits alone, a distinguished looking man at the bar, or ask the tavern keeper. Um, I'll ask the tavern keeper. He probably knows all this stuff. You find the tavern keeper breaking up a fight between two drunken soldiers. His solution to their argument is short and sweet. Grabbing the two men by their necks, he slams their heads together with such force that the crack echoes above the deafening clamor of the hall. Brass Street, he replies, his face lined in thought. Yes, I know it well. Here, I'll show you. The big man produces a greasy piece of paper from his pocket on which he scrawls the directions to Brass Street. You see that it is located on the far side of the city, close to the west wall. You accept the paper, and the tavern keeper accepts your thanks before returning to the crowd to sort out another scuffle in his own inimitable way. Cute. Heal up. You walk to the bar and arrange a room for the night. There are many rooms. I've stayed in a lot. Of, I've done a lot of staying in rooms in this adventure, too. There are many rooms, each of a different standard and price. A blackboard suspended from the ceiling shows the tariffs. Dormitory, two gold crowns a night. Single room, second class, three gold crowns a night. Single room with hot bath, five gold crowns a night. If you can't afford to pay for a room, the tavern keeper will accept a backpack item or weapon in lieu of payment for a night in the dormitory. Uh, how much money do I have? A lot. All right. Well, I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit luxurious right now, and a hot bath is sounding pretty good to me. So I'm going I'm going a whole hog here. Show me to the luxury suite. Single room with a bath. The room is a disappointment. For five gold crowns, you were expecting some degree of luxury, but the small and shabby accommodation you find leaves much to be desired. Steam rising from an open-topped barrel in a corner of the room clouds the air. At first, you think it must be some form of heating, until you discover it is full of soapy water and realize that this is, in fact, your hot bath. 
The meager luxuries of Veretta do not come cheaply. Wow, a barrel. That's best bathtub ever. You bathed before settling down to a good night's rest, but in the middle of the night you were woken by a bright light. A shooting star of sun-like brilliance arcs over the city, shedding a rainbow of color across your drab room. You watch as the star slowly fades and then settle down to sleep once more. It seems as if you have only just closed your eyes when the loud and loathsome clang of the tavern bell fills your ears. I'll awake, I'll awake, a new day dawns, my fine brave lads! As the voice of the tavern keeper echoes through the inn, you gather your equipment and collect your horse from the stable. Hey boss pie, how you doing? A bath, yeah, and it was a pretty, pretty sorry ass bath, apparently. I paid, I paid, like, large sums for this room with a bath. I'm disappointed. I restored three endurance, so I healed myself to full. Make the necessary adjustment to your action chart before setting off on your search for Brass Street. Go into Brass Street. As you ride west along a wide avenue of weathered red stone, you take in the early morning sights of this magnificent city. Window shutters slam open as the Veretians awake to a new day, and smells of breakfast and freshly ground jala waft from shop doorways. There's a little picture of what part of the city looks like, I guess. I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? At the center of the city, you cross a square paved with crystal slabs and pass beneath an archway of polished green stone. Stately halls and public buildings give way to dust-worn shops and a park full of glistening flowers with huge leaves of red, gold, and pink. Beyond the park, a street paved with white gravel leads to a fortified tower, the tallest in the city. It is the Tower of the King, and it marks the entrance to Brass Street. Turning into Brass Street, the sound of bubbling water and quiet chanting drifts towards you on the still air. Old men in brown robes, their heads covered by hoods, glide silently across the white graveled path. You ride under an archway and enter the enclosed courtyard of a grand building, a hall of learning. Suddenly, a tingle runs the length of your spine as you sense you are close to your goal. At the door to the hall, there is a sign that indicates the location of three chambers. The observatory, the library, and the temple. Observatory sounds interesting. Maybe I can find out more about that crazy uh, comet that we had last night, or whatever it was. Shooting star. The door clicks shut behind you. It takes a few seconds for your eyes to grow accustomed to the dimly lit interior, but the room appears to be the antechamber of a larger hall. Following the faint sound of voices, you pass through an archway, along a corridor, and into the main hall. Gathered about a circular table of gleaming steel, a group of elderly men are poring over books, star charts, and astral maps, engrossed in discussion. Globes of blue-white fire hang motionless in the air above them to illuminate their work. The old men do not see you until you are close to their steel table. Their reaction to your sudden appearance is astonishing. They look as though they have seen a ghost. There are yelps of shock and startled expressions. Sweat forms on their brows. The sight is too much for one old man who swoons and faints, falling limply across his books and maps. Only one man remains calm and collected. Here's uh, the sages or the astronomers or whatever they are. Pretty interesting. They look pretty shocked to see me. If you've ever visited a hut on Raiders Road in a previous Lone Wolf adventure? I think I did. 
I think Raiders Road, first of all, Raiders Road was in book four on the way to um, Ruinon. I think I visited the hut in there and met an old man who gave me that scroll, the scroll of the uh, like prophecy about the about the sacrifice and Vashna and all that. So I think that's what this is talking about. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, I was right. Instantly, you recognize the old man who stands before you now, calm and smiling. It is the same old man whom you encountered in a hut on the road to Ruinon some years ago. The same man who handed you a scroll that foretold the dangers of the Chasm of Doom. Welcome, Lone Wolf, he says. Once again, the stars have dictated that our paths would cross. Calm yourselves, my brothers. It is he. It is the Kai Lord. Slowly, as the startled old men regained their composure, their shocked expressions changed to ones of awe and reverence. I am Gwynion, says their leader. We have been expecting your arrival. He points to the charts that cover the table and to a massive telescope that is fixed to a platform in the domed ceiling. The stars divine the shape of things to come. They are our advisors. We know of your quest for the Lore Stone. We know that it is the true quest and we pledge our help. But there are many of our brethren who fear its power. They choose to ignore the wisdom of the stars, and they have pledged themselves to a foolish and dangerous vow to keep hidden the location of the Lore Stone and to kill all who seek it, for fear they would use it for their own ends. All right, good night, Boss Pie. Have a good one. Here's a picture of the shooting star, I guess, and some kind of astronomy device, I guess. So some of their brethren, they want to hide the lore stone, right? Suddenly his words are cut short by the beating of fists against the observatory door. Your horse has been discovered. Give him to us! Shouts a chorus of angry voices. Quickly, we must leave, says Gwynion, and he ushers you into a smaller room. A hidden catch is pulled, and a secret panel opens to reveal the passage. As you follow the sage and his companions into the darkness, you hear the door to the observatory splinter and break. I always like, I always like me some secret passages. That's good times. The passage leads to a vaulted cellar as cold and as silent as a tomb. Gwynion talks with his brothers, who then hurry off towards a distant portal. As they disappear into the dark, he returns to your side, his face somber but composed. The Lore Stone of Veretta is hidden in the crypt of the Cathedral of Takaro. This key will unlock the tomb in which it lies. He produces a small silver key from his sleeve and gives it to you. My brothers will provide a swift horse for your journey. When the observatory clock strikes midnight, enter the portal and follow the passage to the end. It passes beneath the city wall, and your horse will be waiting there when the passage comes to the surface. You are welcome to take any items you require from this cellar that may be of use to you on your quest. May the gods protect you, Lone Wolf. You nod your thanks and watch as Gwynion disappears into the portal. The cellar is well stocked with provisions, and you find the following items that could be of use on your journey to Takaro. Food, quarterstaff, mace, brass whistle. I've already actually got a brass whistle. Rope, short sword. I've already got a rope also. Small silver key. Small silver key. Together with the small silver key that Gwynion gave you, you collect together all the items you wish to keep, and settle down for the long wait till midnight. When the observatory clock strikes twelve, you are poised and ready to enter the portal. You follow a dry stone passageway until you arrive at an iron door. 
It opens with a grating squeal and a gust of damp, earthy air, mixed with a strange sweetness. Billows out. Before you, a narrow stone stairway twists away into the darkness. You are forced to tread carefully on the green and slippery steps. At the bottom of the stairs, a rough-hewn tunnel disappears to the west. You press on, and eventually arrive at another iron door. Gwynion has kept his word, for beyond the door awaits a fine liver chestnut mare, saddled and ready to ride. You are in a small copse, close to a highway junction. In the light of the moon, you can see a signpost that indicates two destinations, Amory and Sorin. Consult the map before deciding which way to go. Let's consult the map, then. Do a little map consulting. Turn this off for a second. Alright, we're at Verretta right here. Amory's here. Sorin is here. We are headed to Takaro, which is down here. So, Amory is a more direct line to Takaro. Sorin's kind of out of the way. There's really no reason to go to Sorin. So that's the answer to that. We'll go to Amory. You ride all night without sleep, with only the moon to light your way and the howling wind as your companion. As the first light of dawn creeps over the horizon, you see a small village less than a mile ahead. A dog barks gruffly at you as you ride into the refuse-strewn streets, and you are forced to drive it away with the toe of your boot as it snaps persistently at your horse's hind legs. On the far side of the village, where the highway enters a line of scattered hills, a fortified manor house stands guard. A large sign, faded by wind and rain, proclaims a curious message. Amory Cess, Three Gold Crowns. Uh, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by this. I don't know what that means. I'm probably going to end up having to pay three gold crowns, but let's check it out. I'm going to stop and inquire at the manor house about the meaning of the sign. Spurring your horse up the steep path to the manor house, you pass beneath its turreted gate and halt at a small outhouse whose walls are embellished with intricate ironwork. The top half of a stable door swings open, and a spiky-haired youth leers at you. Be wanting a cess for Amory? He says offhandedly. Three gold crowns! He holds a square of blue card in one hand and presents an open palm with the other. I'm gonna ask him what a cess is. It's a tax you gotta pay to enter Amory, he answers, irritated by your ignorance of local customs. This is Lyris and Amory's insanity. He explains, emphasizing every word as if you were deaf or dull-witted. You will need a sass to enter Amory. Teach him some manners? That's fucked up. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna drub this poor kid just because he's a little bit uh, socially... I'll just give him the fucking three crowns. The youth snatches your gold, flicks the square of blue card at you, and slams shut the outhouse door. It is stamped with today's date and will allow you access to the town of Amory on this day only. Pocket the sass and leave. So three crowns. I have to get rid of something though, in order to uh, take that. I don't want to get rid of any of this stuff. Hold on, let me check something real quick. Just gonna back it up. When this guy gave me the silver key... Alright, that's to unlock the tomb. I have to have that silver key. Um, I guess I'll get rid of the prism. Yeah, Prism's gone. Goodbye, Prism. The 
It'd be great if that guy's just a con artist and he put that sign up and it's a fake and he just takes three crowns from people for a thing that they don't even need. That would be awesome. By noon, the hills lie far behind and you catch your first sight of the snow-capped centers. To the south, nestling at the foot of this mountain range, is Amory. You were tired after your ride, but you know you must press on if you are to reach the town by nightfall. You reach a junction where a stone signpost indicates two directions, northwest to Sorin and south to Amory. Both towns lie exactly 25 miles from this point. You are hungry and must now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Why the fuck would I change direction and head for Sorin? Where's my map? Alright, so if I'm exactly... Exactly between Sorin and Amory, and I'm trying to get to Takaro. Why exactly would I turn and go back north to Sorin? It doesn't make any sense. Of course, I'm not going to do that. Continuing to ride to Amory. Oh, I have, and now I need to eat it, but I can hunt here. We're, we're in hunting t mode now, so I'm going to hunt and ignore that meal. Continue to ride to Amory. An hour after sunset, you arrive at the gates of Amory. Beneath the deepening shadow of its watchful guard tower, you fight back your fatigue and wait as the gate creaks open. A soldier wearing a halberd of black and gold chainmail strides forward and demands to see a cess. I happen to have a cess, thank you. The guard snatches the square of blue card from between your fingers, then walks over to a sputtering wall torch, which he removes from its bracket. Holding the torch high, he returns and examines first the card, and then your face. Enter! He snarls, crumbling the card in his hairy fist. You flick your heel and urge your tired horse through the town gate. Oh my god. I just got to an instant death. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> I know now why I shouldn't have gone to Amory. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Alarm bells ring, gruff voices bellow and scream, and the crunching of boots on stone echoes round the town. A troop of soldiers surround you, their faces twisted and unnatural in the glare of their flaming torches. Your senses have been dulled by fatigue, and you are dragged from the saddle and disarmed before you have had a chance to react. Cold iron chains are wound tightly around your arms and body, and you are roughly pushed into a gray stone gale. A wave of terror engulfs you as you catch a fleeting glimpse of a poster pasted to the gale door. You see your own face before you. Beneath it is written, Death Sentence, by order of Lord Rourke, Highborn of Amory. Within the hour, your head is resting upon the executioner's block. As the razor-sharp blade of a two-handed axe whistles towards your neck, the last sound you hear is the malicious and vengeful laugh of the young lordling. Your life and your quest end here. I died! I got an instant death choice. My bad. I need to see something right now. I need to see something. I'm gonna go... real quick. Just going through my my options real quick. All right. Was anything? I want to know if anything was said about this guy. Yep, he did say it. He said it. Highborn of Amory. So I was warned. If I would have remembered that, I would have known that I had a good reason not to go to Amory. All right, so that was that was my fuck up. That's cool though. I knew, I needed to know if they actually warned you or not, and they did. They did. All right, I'm gonna back it up all the way. To here. 
I'm going to give myself three crowns back. I'm going to give myself a prism back. And I'm going to head for Sorin instead of Amory. So, now I know why we wouldn't go that way. Because we have a terrible enemy who is like a very powerful man there. Highway to Sorin. The night passes without sleep. The howling wind of the Veretian Plain is your only companion as you ride the long, straight, moonlit highway to Sorin. When dawn finally breaks, you find yourself on the outskirts of a small and undistinguished hamlet of half-timbered buildings, whose only unusual feature is a bronze statue of a roguish-looking young man that stands in front of the blacksmith's shop. Huh, let's examine the statue. The weather-worn plaque bolted to the base of the statue says that this is a true likeness of Vinar Jupe, who led a band of robbers that preyed on travelers, especially merchants. His many crimes, including murder, did not prevent him from becoming popular, for he was resourceful and daring, and never plundered the inhabitants of this hamlet, where he himself was born. His exploits, and those of a score of his gang, were ended by the executioner's axe after trial at Amory. I know them feels. I know how it feels to be killed by an executioner's axe in Amory, actually. <laughs> Been there. There is a slit in the belly of the statue through which gold coins can be dropped. The plaque goes on to say that anyone who pays homage to the stature of Vinar Jupe will be protected by his spirit from robbers and highwaymen. If you wish to make a donation, place some gold crowns into the statue of Vinar Jupe before leaving the hamlet. I'll put a coin in there. I don't care. I'll drop a coin in the statue. Shortly before noon, you pass through a deserted village. The burnt-out ruins of cottages and farmsteads dot the landscape like charred skeletons the unmistakable signs of war. A mile or two further along the highway, you come across a church. A man, his clothes ragged and covered with mud, is moving amongst the gravestones, staggering like a wounded carrion crow. As you reach the church gate, he sees you and cries out pitifully for help. I do not have curing. Is this guy, like, diseased, like another leper of some kind? I don't have curing, but I'm going to try to help the man. Suddenly, a dozen grim-faced robbers spring up from behind the churchyard wall. The wounded man straightens himself and unsheathes a rusty scimitar, an evil cackle issuing from his black-toothed mouth. The robbers vault the stone wall and run at you, brandishing their tarnished weapons above their heads. Due to their numbers, you may only evade in the first round of combat. I'm not evading shit. These guys are going to die, and they're going to die in an ugly way. Mind Blast also, suckas. That puts me at plus 12, which means I've got... Yeah, it's going to be ugly. Alright, here we go, round one. I lost two, they lost ten. I lost none, they lost the remaining twenty-two. Get killed, Grave Wobbers! Did I say Grave Wobbers? Grave Wobbers! Suddenly I pronounce Oz as W's. Grave Robbers. So, that just happened. And then I start healing. You wipe your weapon on the cloak of a dead Grave Robber and turn him over with the toe of your boot. Several graves bear the signs of the grave robber's labor. The freshly dug soil is heaped high, and coffin lids lie shattered and discarded everywhere. The weapons these men used are old and pitted with rust and obviously acquired, like the rest of their booty, from graves and tombs. 
A search of the bodies reveals 27 gold crowns, a bottle of wine, and a mirror. You may take any of these items before leaving the churchyard. Well, I'll max myself back out on crowns. Thank you. A uh, bottle of wine and a mirror. I don't know. Probably should stop carrying this fucking towel around. Seriously. There's no way I'm ever going to use this towel. There's just no way. It's not going to happen. There's never going to be a time in these Magna Kai books when it's going to be like, if you possess a towel, turn to... No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We know this. We know this. And yet, it's just... It's hilarious to carry the towel around. No, got to stick with my towel. I'm sorry. I'm a Douglas Adams fan. So does that mean... Do I, do I want to get rid of something and take a mirror? No, fuck it. I'm not taking that junk. I'm going to regret it later, probably, but I'm not taking it. Heal up. You were tired after your long night's ride, but you know you must press on if you are to reach the town of Sorin by nightfall. You come to a shallow stream which crosses the highway, and here you stop briefly at a ford to wash and rest. You must also now eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Hunting! Besides the ford, sends a signpost pointing to the west, Soren, 25 miles. Night has fallen by the time you reach the river town of Soren, and the sky is clear and full of stars that sparkle with icy splendor. You ride the main street toward the quay, where a score of river ships lie docked at the town. Their signal lamps, shimmering red and green from the mast tops, reflect upon the cold, dark waters of the river Storn. A board standing beside the gangplank to a large transport caravel catches your eye. On it are chalked the prices of passage to three destinations. Luyen, 10 gold crowns. Rem, 15 gold crowns. Eula, 20 gold crowns. A fourth destination, Tekaro, has been crossed out and scribbled beside it is cancelled due to war. Great. Uh, well, we better look at the map real quick. Looking at the map again. Alright, we're in Sorin. We need to get to Takaro. So, one goes here, one goes here. So I could take a ship, a the boat all the way to Eula, which would get me really close to Takaro. But that doesn't really sound very interesting. <laughs> I think I'd rather go overland and have whatever adventures might happen on the way there. I mean, there could be adventures taking the boat, of course, but... Plus, that's a lot of gold. No, I'm, I'm not going to take the boat. Because, I mean, I remember I've had bad experiences with taking ships places. Ship be getting crashed and I lose all my stuff. Ship gets ambushed by a giant fleet of death hulks. I mean, bad things have happened to me on ships before. As you ride along the quay, you study your map of the Stormlands for an alternative route to Takaro. There are two roads that will take you there. The mountain highway through the centers via Rem, or the valley highway through Amory and the forest of Eula. Well, I'm not going through Amory. Lack of sleep and fatigue from your long ride clouds your mind, and you decide that your first priority must be to have a good night's sleep. A quayside tavern displays a sign promising the most comfortable beds in all of Sorin. This is all you need to be persuaded to stable your horse and enter its doors. Man, I've gone in a shitload of inns and taverns in this adventure. This is the adventure of shopping, spending money, and sleeping in taverns. Like, it really is. Loud and raucous laughter greets your tired ears as you enter the Stornside Tavern. A motley throng of drinkers, overdressed and overarmed, 
prop up the bar along the back wall. Suddenly, a voice calls out to you, and you raise your weary eyes. It is the captain, the mercenary leader you met at the Inn of the Cross Swords. Oh, cool. But how does the book know that I met him? Magic, I guess. Well met, my friend! He cries and slaps you enthusiastically on the shoulder. So you've changed your mind! You have come to join my band of fearless fighters! Before you have a chance to reply, a foaming tankard is thrust into your hand. To the battle and a full purse! He shouts, and his toast is echoed by a score of drunken voices. The captain and his men are bound for Eula aboard the riverboat that leaves at midnight. If you sail with them, he will pay for your passage. Sailing with the captain is a little more tempting, but I still think I want to I want to go on on foot. Thank you though. Going by road. Wait, is it forcing me to go to Amory? Yup. All right, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> you sleep soundly and then rise an hour after dawn, clear-headed and eager to continue your ride. The morning news from the south is that the mountain highway to Rem is impassable. An avalanche has destroyed all traces of the road near Mount Navalin, and it will be many weeks before the rubble is cleared and the road rebuilt. This leaves you with only one choice. You must take the valley road through Amory and the forest of Eula. You gather together your equipment and set off without delay. If you are to reach Amory by sunset, you will need to ride at great speed and without a break. Okay, then we've been here before. And this time I don't have a sass, so let's see what happens. The soldier removes a sputtering torch from a bracket on the wall and returns to your side. Holding the torch high, he casts his eye over you and your horse and rubs his stubbly chin. Come from Veretta or Sorin? Long ride either way, you must be tired. In you go, but in the future be sure to get a cess. Some of my brother guards ain't so understanding. Thank the guard and ride in through the town gate and die. Okay. I managed to die twice to the same section, coming at it two different ways. <laughs> nice. Alright, obviously I'm sailing with the captain then. That's cool that I got to sail for free instead of spending 20. Alright. So two deaths. Two deaths in this book. It's the first time I've died twice, and I'm not even done. I could die more times. We'll see. Sailing with the captain at midnight. With your horse stabled safely in the hold of the Kazanara, all that remains for you to do is find your cabin. This proves to be a tiny room at the bow, but at least it has a comfortable bunk, and you fall asleep as soon as your head touches the feather pillow. There's the boat. You wake an hour after dawn and peer out of the circular porthole at the shadowy riverbank. Drizzle obscures all detail and the sky is tinged with gray. As day approaches, the river mist grows thicker and whiter and you go up on deck. The captain stands alone at the rail, the shoulders of his leather cloak soaked by the cold drizzle. He nods a welcome and points to the center mountains now hidden in the mist. This foul weather rubs as a landmarks, but by my reckoning, we should be in Loyan by noon. You stare through the gray, damp air and pull your cloak closely around your shoulders. Or was that the captain of the mercenary company? Or is it the captain of the boat? I assumed it's the captain of the boat, therefore a different person. If you've completed the lower circle of Solaris, no, I haven't. So you would have had to have chosen those three as your first three. I almost did. But I took Divination instead of Hunt Mastery. I've not completed this lore circle. Suddenly there is a tremendous jolt and you are thrown headfirst against the rail. Lose to Endurance. 
The screech of twisting metal and splintering wood tears through the silence as the Kazunara shudders, shudders and dips violently. The boat has hit a boom. A line of logs chained together across the river. Uh-oh, we're about to get jumped. Hell's teeth, cries the captain. Have we run aground? As the words leave his, leave his lips, a grapnel and rope drop from the sky and bite into the ship's rail. More follow, and, through the mist, you can make out the shapes of longboats approaching. River pirates! shouts the helmsman. Prepare to repel borders! Further along the deck, one of the captain's men is felled by a thrown knife. His comrades rush to his aid, but by now the river pirates are pouring over the side and he is trampled underfoot. Battle order! bellows the captain, and immediately his men respond, linking shields and holding their ground. A swarm of grim-faced pirates are boarding close by. One of the, See what I said about taking boats, by the way? One of their number, a lean man with only one ear and a split nose, smiles at you with anticipation, his lips drawn back from his teeth and his eyes wide with excitement. He is obviously relishing the thought of ending your life. <laughs> yeah, this guy doesn't understand who, who he's looking at. I don't really see much of a reason to use my bow here. I think I'm just ready to go up there and kill a bunch of dudes with the Sommer Sword and call it a day. I'm just gonna go in. I don't need to waste an arrow on this fool. The man shrieks his battle cry and lashes out with a heavy bladed cutlass. A Deldinian River Pirate. Look at him. He's got 27 com He's got 17 combat skill. He's a joke. Mind Blast also, son. Alright, here we go. I'm gonna kill this guy in one round. 29, 23. Not quite. Not quite. Two rounds then, for sure. He didn't even tur- he didn't even touch me! He didn't even scratch me! With his heavy bladed cutlass. He just got heavy bladed cut down. Thanks for playing, Del Denian River Pirate. Go sleep with the fishes. I won. Combat lasted less than three rounds. Thank you. Leaping over the dead bodies, you fight your way across the deck to where the captain is in combat with five pirates. While he attacks with a longsword in his right hand, he parries enemy cutlasses with a bronze sleeve shield that encases his left forearm. That sounds cool. He fights with cool determination, making light work of the battle-clumsy pirates. Then a war horn heralds the arrival of a new and formidable wave of attackers. You anticipate the captain's danger and rush to protect his back from the snarling, mad-eyed pirate berserkers. Oh, this is awesome. I remember this image. I remember this one of the captain. Clang. And he's just wrecking shop. Alright, pirate berserkers. Due to their state of battle frenzy, the pirate berserkers are immune to mind blast, but not psi surge. Okay, well, that's fine. I don't need Mind Blast to beat these guys. They are a little bit tougher than the last dude. Pirate Berserkers, come at me. 29-30. Go. I lost three, they lost eight. Round two. I lost nothing. They lost so many. 18. I lost none, they died. How about that, Pirate Berserkers? How about that? I won. A little healing needs to happen here. The tide of battle is turned in your favor. The pirates came in search of easy plunder, but your furious resistance has broken their nerve. They flee from the decks, scrambling into the longboats to escape. The captain follows them, hewing at them with his sword. He cuts his way to the ship's rail and grabs the pirate leader by the neck. He rams the man's head against the mainmast, once, twice, three times, with a rage that splits the timber and the pirate's leather-clad skull. Ha! He cries gleefully. I've always said the Daldenians have no head for a fight! And this captain's a badass. The battle ends as swiftly as it began, 
with the surviving pirates melting away like phantoms into the fog. There are a few casualties amongst the mercenaries, but the boat's crew have been decimated. The pirate berserkers trapped them below decks and slaughtered them. Only one escaped their murderous blades. The captain takes command, marshalling repairs and overseeing the burial of the dead. As the bodies sink beneath the dark waters, the Kazanara emerges from the mist to the welcoming sight of Luyan. We made it to Luyan, which is not very far. We haven't exactly taken a long voyage here. I mean, we started in... So I guess we've come reasonably far. But we need to come all the way down. I mean, we have a long way to go. We gotta sail the Ram and to Eula, and then finally go to Takaro. Luyan, the city of flowers and wine, greets you. Its towers, timbered houses, and fortified perimeter walls silhouetted against the sky. It lies in the shadow of the centers, at a dangerous bend where the fast flowing storm undercuts the sheer slopes of Mount Prindar. The captain docks at the Luyan Quay for provisions, and as his men busy themselves with a myriad of duties and tasks, you accompany him on a visit to the Luyan Apothecary. The entrance to this famed establishment is marked by a huge stone jar creaking on its chains. The shop is vast and full of things that stir your curiosity. Towers of co containered liquids, Mountains of coarse-grained powders, and forests of roots and herbs crowd the bleached wooden shelves. The captain seeks medicines of strength and healing in readiness for the battle ahead, and the herb master's eyes widen with delight when he reads the captain's list. They are his most expensive preparations. Examine the potions, or take a look at some of the other shops in this street. Uh... I don't really care about the potions. I'm not really in the market for any potions right now. Kind of want to check out the other shops in the street. Also. Kind of want to heal myself. Other shops in the street, go. You agree to meet the captain and the apothecary in one hour's time before beginning your exploration of Luyan. Further along the street, you notice a dusty shop window full of weapons. Above the door, you see a sign. Demico's Weapon Shop. All weapons bought and sold. Do I want to look at the weapon shop? I don't need a new weapon per se, but I might be able to like... There's one thing I haven't ever replaced of the stuff that I lost, and that's a helmet. I'd like to get a new helmet. But it doesn't say weapons and armor, it just says weapons. Let's see what else there is. At the end of the street, you stop to look in the window of a tall, half-timbered shop. It contains a fascinating selection of maps and charts, which detail the various cities and regions of Magnamund. You enter the shop and browse the shelves that line the walls. Three maps in particular attract your interest. A map of Summerland for five gold crowns, a map of Takaro for four gold crowns, and a map of Luyan for three gold crowns. The maps are backpack items. If you wish to buy one or all of them, make the necessary adjustments to your action chart before returning to the apothecary. Hmm. I'm gonna have to ditch something, because I want a map of Takaro. I'm gonna ditch one of my one of my potions. I know I should get rid of the towel, I know. But I don't wanna get rid of the I don't wanna throw in the towel. I don't wanna be a quitter on the on towel quest. Throw in the towel, you get it? Because you know, it's it's literal and figurative at the same time. It's beautiful. Alright, map of Takaro. I'll pay my four gold. I keep maxing back out my gold and then spending a bunch and then maxing it back out, so whatever. Now I have to go back to the apothecary.
fully healed. You help the captain to carry his purchases, which fill two large wooden boxes. As you stagger from the apothecary, he tells you he is anxious to return to the boat without delay. His men are good soldiers, but poor sailors. He fears that without his watchful eye and stern command, they will forget their work and drink themselves into a stupor. His fears are unfounded, for upon your return to the quay, the Kazanara is fitted out and ready to sail. <coughs> Excuse me. Cast off, booms the captain, enjoying the novelty of his new riverboat command. We'll make Rem by nightfall. See, all this time, I've been thinking this was the captain of the ship. But I don't think it is the captain of the ship. I think all this time this is supposed to be the captain of the mercenaries. Which makes sense why he was kicking so much ass in the fight. At which point I've been using the wrong voice for him because I thought he was some new captain. But I think this is the, the mercenary captain. And I've been fucking up. I think, I think it's the mercenary captain. But I don't know for sure. As dusk settles over the storm... You sail into the Horseshoe Harbor at Rem. Oh, we made it to Rem already. Okay. <clears throat> the city is choked with people. Mercenaries from the north and west. Weapon merchants from the east and ragged refugees from the war-torn south. The captain orders his men to sleep abo aboard the Kazanara this night, forbidding them to go ashore. For Prince Balon of Rioma and his mercenary knights are encamped inside the city wall. A bitter and long-standing rivalry exists between the two companies, and the captain wisely wishes to avoid any confrontation. See, the captain is the mercenary captain. There was never any other second new captain. It was, it's always been him. Rumor has it that a number of the Stormland's most powerful princes are gathered in Rem to plot the defeat of the Slovians. However, the captain believes it is more likely that the robber barons are conspiring against each other to steal the riches of Takaro for themselves. You set sail at first light, bidding farewell to the slender twin towers of the Rem Citadel, which overshadows the city key. The storm flows southwards through steep-sided fields of vines, arranged in endless straight rows like the waves of a green sea. The weather is warm, and you spend the day on deck watching the traffic of refugees heading north along a highway, and the strange gigantic toads, the sloats, at work, pulling riverboats and barges upstream. That's cool. Pull, get their boats pulled upstream by giant toads. That's evocative. It is late afternoon when you sight the town of Eula in the distance. You must sign this end user license agreement to enter our town. See what I, what I did there. Eula. You saddle your horse and shelter your equipment as the Kazanara bursts at the town's wooden pier. Uh, I don't have a riverboat ticket. You ride into Eula at the captain's side, his banner emblazoned with a flaming battle axe fluttering overhead. The town has been turned into a huge army encampment. Its people have long since fled to the north, abandoning their homes and livestock to the gold-hungry soldiers. Men from a dozen nations rub shoulders with warriors of less than human origins, united by common greed. The captain turns to the south, where the highway is clogged with foot soldiers. As you catch your first glimpse of Takaro, burning beneath a pall of black smoke, your heart sinks. This is where the Lore Stone lies, in a city under siege from an army of 10,000 fighting men. As you approach a tangle of siege works at the bank of the River Quarrel, the captain points to an encampment in a field to your left, where a blue flag with a gold eagle flutters in the soot-laden air. Prince Uvin's standard, he says. The time has come to meet our paymaster. Uh, should I stay with the captain's company or leave the mercenaries? Uh, that's a good question. 
Let's stay with the captain's company and maybe see if we get some information from this prince or whatever. Prince Uven holds a conference of war. An hour passes before the captain returns to the company, and his news is greeted with mixed feelings by his travel-weary men. We ride into battle tonight, he says, his voice firm and unwavering. We are to lead an attack across the Takaro Bridge to break the city gate, which is greatly weakened at the moment. We must attack tonight if the enemy are to be prevented from making good their repairs. That guy's got like a portcullis on his shield. Many of his men, battle-hardened veterans of countless wars, cannot hide their fear that the attack is suicidal. The gate is heavily defended by archers and cannot be taken without a great loss of life. Each man will be paid a thousand crowns. Whoa, that is a fuck ton of money, says the captain, hoping to change their minds with the promise of gold. But few are impressed. What use is gold to them if they are killed in the assault? Those who wish to fight can stay by my side, he bellows, his steel blue eyes blazing with anger. Those who will not fight can go. Wow, do I want to go assault the city gate with this guy? That's probably suicide. Or if I'm like, alright, it's been nice. <laughs> I'll holla. Um, yeah. Assaulting the city gate is definitely suicide. But I want to do it anyway. Arrows sweep across the river as the captain draws the company into line at the approach to the Takaro Bridge. The burnt-out hulks of siege towers and the bodies of dead soldiers lie strewn in heaps before the battered city gate. The fortified gatehouse bristles with archers, and the setting sun glints on the cauldrons of boiling oil and molten lead mounted on top of the battlements. Alright, that sounds pretty serious. CHARGE! screams the captain, and suddenly you are swept up and carried across the bridge by a frenzied wave of horsemen. Thirty yards from the gate, the archers open fire. Pick a number. One of these numbers leads to instant death, probably. A two! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Am I going to death? Am I going to instant death? No. I'm not... My horse... Your horse is killed instantly in the rain of arrows. As it crashes to the ground, you are hurled forwards, somersaulting through the air before landing in a heap on the blood-stained soil. The archers have brought down the first two ranks of horsemen, but the attack is still pressing forward over the dead and dying in a reckless stampede towards the gate. You are now lying in the path of the stampede. Leap over the parapet of the bridge, curl up into a ball and keep completely still. That's not going to work. Or just run towards the gate. Oh man, every, every one of these options sounds bad. Run towards the gate! Suicide time! Oh, I was right! It's suicide! A hail of arrows engulfs you, and an agonizing explosion of pain fills your head, chest, and legs. You are mortally wounded, and although you fight for your life, the struggle is soon over, as you are trampled into the Takaro Bridge by the captain's men. Your quest, and your life, end here. That's three deaths on this book. The Kingdoms of Terror is fucking me up. Alright, no, seriously though, leap over the parapet of the bridge. That seems like the only... You vault the parapet with barely seconds to spare and tumble into the cold, rushing waters of the river quarrel. You are alive, but are being swept away from the bridge by the river's irresistible current. I don't like the sound of this. Desperately, you fight against the current and claw your way towards the bank. Breathless, freezing, and soaking wet, you stagger from the water and collapse on the rocks. Unless you have the Magna Chi discipline of Nexus, you lose one endurance point due to the extreme cold. Sure. As your senses return, you find that you have emerged from the river close to where the quarrel joins the river's storm. You see a small cave in the base of the city wall, less than 20 feet from where you lie, a rusty crisscross of iron covering its mouth. Judging by the foul smell of the water pouring from its depths, you suspect it to be a sewer outfall. Really? I gotta go crawl through some sewers again? We're doing this again? Already? I did this in the last book. 
Suddenly, a flicker of hope returns as you realize that this outfall could lead right into the heart of Takaro. Yeah, I'm hopeful as shit. Literally hopeful as shit because it's a sewer and there's shit in there. Just saying. Alright, I'm gonna heal myself. As I descend into the muck. I have a map of Takaro though, I'm so smart. There is a gaping hole in the crisscrossed bars, large enough for you to pass through with ease. The fetid water that is combed by this grill contains all manner of filth, a veritable feast for rats and vermin. However, as you wade deeper into the tunnel, you gradually realize that the sewer is completely free of rats, and in fact, seems to be totally devoid of all life. That is not a good sign. Circular shoots appear at regular intervals in the tiled ceiling but they are far too small and slippery to climb. Fifteen minutes after entering the sewer, you arrive at a major junction where two new channels flow into the main course. Map of Takaro time. So glad I bought that. Okay, let's go. In the dim light of the sewer, you can just discern the outlines of the curtain wall and the streets of Takaro on your map. The cathedral is right in the center of the city, approximately half a mile from the point where the two rivers meet, and lying due east of the point at which you entered the sewer. You fold the map and set off again towards your objective. So, east. Okay. A hundred yards along the passage, you see a flight of stone steps ascending to a stone trap door set flush with the ceiling. Uh, I've got to investigate this, you know, just to see. The trap door is heavy and stiff, but gradually its seal of rust cracks and loosens under the pressure. Inch by inch, you force it open to reveal at last the cobblestoned city square. Across the square, directly ahead, is the Cathedral of Takaro. As the square is teeming with guards, you are forced to close the hatch quickly to avoid being detected. You estimate that the cathedral is approximately 200 yards due east. As you descend the steps and continue through the passage, you pray that the sewer will give access to the crypt. I do pray that. I've got to pray just to make it today. Less than 50 yards along the channel, Another passage joins the main flow from the right. Uh, no, pressing on. Main course. You press on diligently, counting the steps that take you along the sewer, until you reach a narrow vault a little over 150 yards from the previous junction. An iron ladder, its rungs pitted with rust, rises out of the water to an arched stone door. Beneath the door, the sewer continues into the darkness. Let's check out the ladder and the arched door. The door is old and decayed. It has not been opened for over a hundred years. If you are to find out what lies beyond it, you will have to clear away the dirt that jams the hinges. I do not have Nexus or Psy Surge. Only brute force will break the seal of encrusted filth and open the door. I'm, I'm fighting a door. I'm fighting a door. This is what it's come to. I'm questioning my life choices right now. To break open the door, you should follow the normal combat rules. Any endurance points that you lose during this combat represent the fatigue you suffer as you hack and batter the door. Alright. I'll hack down the door with my sword. I guess. Seems legit. Is the door? It doesn't say the door is immune to mind blast. It does not say it. <laughs> I know, I'm not going to use Mind Blast. It's obviously it's a door, it doesn't have a mind. But it doesn't say that it's immune to Mind Blast, I'm just saying. Rules as written, I could Mind Blast this fucking door. <laughs> but no, I'm not going to. I understand the spirit here. Alright, here we go. Um, Round one. Killed it. One hit. The Sommer Sword gets it done. I just walked up to this door, swung the Sommer Sword once, and just staved the door in. Like, just destroyed it. Shards of wood flying everywhere. And I suffered no fatigue. 
Didn't even have to mind blast the door. The old stone door creaks slowly open, and as the dust settles, you find yourself staring into the crypt of Takaro Cathedral. Stepping into the chill, stale air, your heart begins to pound in your chest. The lore stone is here. You can feel it. Beams of ashen moonlight filter into the crypt, illuminating a line of somber granite tombs that lie like sleeping giants under the earth. Clutching the small silver key, you examine them one by one for the lock that guards the legendary lore stone. You find the lock and insert the key, but you are suddenly distracted on the brink of discovery by the creature that is advancing through the sewer door. Uh-oh. We got some kind of boss fight, I have a feeling. Here we go. A huge lumbering monster stalks towards you. It is over 10 feet high with thick, twisted, hairy limbs and eight fingered hands tipped by razor sharp talons. Baleful, monstrous eyes protrude from yellow slits in its glistening head and a long reptilian tail whips behind it. Its hideous and peculiar gibbering fills the moonlight crypt as it draws nearer and nearer. Now this thing sounds officially scary. I would like to use my bow. Yeah, we're, we're using an arrow on this thing. Trembling with fear, you draw the bowstring and fire. The arrow glances off its armored head and shatters against the crypt wall. There is no time for a second shot. You shoulder your bow and prepare for close combat as the creature moves in to strike. Damn it. Arrow wasted. F4 left. Alright, it's moving in to strike. It's a Dacomid! Alright, its combat skill isn't ludicrous, so I should be able to beat it. The hideous creature gurgles with anger and springs forward to attack. That was its angry gurgle, just so you know. It's, sometimes you get sound effects up in here. <laughs> that, does, what, that was more funny sounding than terrifying sounding. Alright, it's immune to Psy Surgeon Mind Blast, fine. Let's do this. Has 50 endurance, which is a nice chunk of endurance. If I reduce it to 25 or less, do not continue combat, but instead immediately turn to 310. Alright, let's go. Uh, 30 and 50. I lost 3, it lost 7. Round 2. I lost 2, it lost... Uh, I don't remember what it had before. A, a bunch. Like, like 9. 25 and 34. I lost none. It lost 12, and it's now under 25 endurance, so let's see what happens. Is this not even its final form? Is it about to, like, go into phase two or something? The crypt floor is crawling with the severed remains of the monster, which still writhe blindly forward with maniacal intent. Spider-like, a severed hand climbs your leg. Oh, shit. I shouldn't have been hitting battle. I was trying to end the battle. How much endurance did I just have? I had 25. How do I get out of battle without... Oh, I can just... Okay, I'm, I'm dumb. I have 25. Spider-like, a severed hand climbs your leg and embeds its talons in your flesh. You lose two endurance points. As you fight to free yourself from its vice-like grip, the torn pieces of the Dacomid's body gather themselves together for another attack. Uh, leap forward and strike the creature before it is fully completely formed. Oh! Another instant death! Oh my god! Four deaths in this book! Four! The Dacomid shudders and reels back as your weapon makes impact, sinking deep into flesh that clings like jelly and reeks of a charnel smell that closes your throat. A drop of its watery blood smashes, splashes on your arm, eating through your tunic and searing your flesh. Your weapon disintegrates. The, the Samus word disintegrated? What? 
corroded by the blood. Before you can pull away, a razor-sharp talon snares your cloak and draws you to your doom! Your life and your quest end here in the crypt of Takaro Cathedral. That sucks when you die, like when you're literally one section away from the end of the book. Alright. Wow, this book ruled me. It, it rolled me. It kicked my ass. It, it did something bad to me. I'd lost... I died four times and lost the archery contest. Okay. I meant to say, I wish to unlock the tomb and retrieve the lore stone, please. As the door creaks open, a sun-like radiance pours from the tomb and floods the crypt with golden light, its searing intensity paralyzing the Dacomid. You grasp the lore stone and your sense is real with newfound wisdom and strength. Instinctively, you raise your weapon and strike the monster at the base of its hideous skull. It shrieks and dies instantly. Erase the small silver key. Goodbye, small silver key. Turn to 350. You know what that means. That means book one. But I died four times. I died four times and lost the archery contest. Just like a death of its own. Before your eyes, the Dacomid's skin ripples as if a wave were washing beneath its skin. Suddenly, a crisscross of wrinkles appears, and layers of transparent bone peel and fall from its shell-like skull. Its body becomes hunched, shrinking and folding by the second, until all that is left is a film of dust on the floor of the crypt. Time has at last caught up with this ancient terror. There we have a picture of the light shining on it and... The Ancient Terror... Dying. That thing is creepy looking. As the golden light begins to fade, you stare at the object of your quest, the Lore Stone of Veretta. But all that you hold in your hand is a hollow sphere of glass, transparent and unremarkable to look at. Your quest has succeeded, for the power of the Lore Stone has been transfused into your body and mind. Its strength and wisdom is now a part of you, and the transfusion signals the beginning of a new and deadly challenge on your quest for the Magna Kai. But be warned! The quest will draw you into a sinister realm where a malicious and terrible evil has grown in power since Sun Eagle first completed the Magna Kai quest. If you possess the courage of a true Kai Master, the challenge and the quest await you in Book 7 of the Lone Wolf series, entitled Castle Death. That sounds intimidating. Castle Death. They're not playing. And that brings us to the end of this book. Victory after only a mere six deaths. And, I'm mean, six, a mere four deaths. And, uh, wow. So, this book involved a lot of staying in inns. A lot of eating, a lot of spending money, a lot of making money, a lot of being in towns, and a lot of deaths. Ah, <laughs> uh, the Kingdoms of Terror, complete. That was fun. That was a good one. We kind of had a rough time with it. But, victory. I get to move on to the next book. Next book I will have Hunt Mastery, which means I will complete the circle of one of them. Circle of Solaris, I think. But, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays, Lone Wolf, Book 6, The Kingdoms of Terror. <laughs>